Nathan Schneider, on the left, uh, is the author of Thank You, Anarchy, uh, which we have for sale on the back. Um, he wrote about Occupy uh, since its inception, uh, covering it as a journalist uh, for both uh, Harper's and The Nation. Um, and he's also the editor of a uh, website some of you might be familiar with, Waging Nonviolence. Uh, Mark Ray, on the right, uh, is uh, an Occupy Wall Street organizer uh, and a PhD in history, a PhD candidate in history at Rutgers. Um, and he wrote the book, uh, which is also for sale at the back, uh, Translating Anarchy. Uh, they're both going to be giving you a presentation about their experiences with the Occupy movement, um, social movements, and uh, the role of anarchism within it. So I'll just hand over to you guys. Mark, do you want to start? Sure. <coughs> oh, and also, I'm going to be passing around a sign up sheet uh, for Red and Black if anyone's interested. Hello? Can you hear me? I should probably use the microphone. I'm not sure how I'll project. Hi. Uh, thanks to Jake. Uh, thanks to Rochester Red and Black. Thanks to you all for coming out. Thanks to the Flying Squirrel. Um, as Jake said, my name's Mark. Um, I was active organizing with Occupy Wall Street during the first year of the movement, and I'm also a longtime political organizer, been involved in a bunch of other stuff, and I'm a history PhD student, so I like to look to history when I talk about stuff. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to talk here. Um, in Occupy Wall Street, I was most active in the press working group, which was essentially the group that interface with the mainstream media. So when journalists would come down to the park and they wanted to speak to someone, they wanted to get uh, a statement from someone who was prepared to speak to the press, um, they would speak to us or we would direct them to someone to speak with. We also wrote the press releases for Occupy Wall Street and tried to craft media strategies around how to best project our message to the wider public. Um, a little bit about the book I wrote, Translating Anarchy. Um, it's not a history of Occupy Wall Street. It's not a narrative of what happened. If you're interested in that, Nathan's book is a narrative about what happened. <coughs> Mine is a political analysis of the organizers in Occupy Wall Street, what they, where they're coming from politically, how they developed, how they radicalized, and so forth. Um, when I first got involved, or actually when I first came down to Zuccotti Park on September 17, 2011, I was not one of the people who was blown away. I did not feel like the revolution had finally come that all my dreams were answered and that this is going to be amazing. I showed up, I was, showed up mostly because I was bored. I was moderately enthused, but then went to get Chinese food in Chinatown, and that was about it. Um, and it's interesting because uh, I'm 31 now, I was 29 at the time, and I feel like if I had been 18 or 19 when I showed up, I would have been so excited. It would have been such a profound experience for me, but after 10 years of political organizing, I was a little jaded and so I said, okay, this is, this is fine, but whatever. But about 10 days later, I started to really see that it was a political force and to see that the politics behind the movement were a lot more profound than I had given it credit for initially. And what I started to realize is there was an interesting political divide between the organizers of the movement, the people who spent seven days a week in the park, who made, made the meetings happen and were doing all the dirty work, and the people who showed up. Now, of course, I'm not trying to elevate one form of political participation over another. We need people who are going to organize, whereas other people don't have the time to put into organizing and can show up and support how they can. But it was interesting in this case that there was a stark political divide between the organizers and the people who attended. And this was entirely missed or in, uh, intentionally ignored by the media. So when you look at the coverage of Occupy Wall Street, you'll see that the mainstream media, CNN, the New York Times, We'll talk about the Occupy Wall Street protesters. Anyone who is in Zuccotti Park, anyone who shows up in a march is a protester, regardless of what role they played in what was going on. And, and this sounds innocuous enough on, on the surface, but if you, if you realize the role that this kind of language has, uh, it really flattens the political dynamics of the movement as a whole and leaves it so that the difference between organizers and supporters is diminished. And it obscures the, the radical politics of people who, who really made the movement happen. And so, given the fact that, even at the time, but especially, especially over the past year or so, the historical memory of Occupy Wall Street is being actively contested, I decided, as, as an organizer and as a historian, that I wanted to do what I can to document the radical nature of the core of Occupy Wall Street, not only for the moment to give people a sense of where we were coming from, 
but for posterity. And so what I did was um, I decided to interview as many of the Occupy Wall Street organizers as I could. And rather than um, just sort of make general statements about their politics, which could just as easily be refuted by someone else who had a different opinion, I tried to ground it in some quantitative data. So I ended up doing 192 interviews with Occupy Wall Street organizers, which is to say with almost all of them, between December 2011 and the, and the winter of 2013. And um, I, had, I found some interesting results. So let me give you a few statistics to give you a sense of what I, I came up with. Um, the main question I asked was, to all the, the uh, organizers was, how would you describe your politics? So I didn't ask people to like pick from a list of options and select a box. You could describe your politics however you wanted to. Use a label, not use a label. Overall, I found that of the 192 interviews, 39% actively identified as an anarchist of one form or another, which is to say they used the word. Now, being an anarchist can mean a wide variety of things, um, some of which I'm really fond of, some of which I'm less fond of, but nevertheless, that word was used by 39% of the people there. But another 33% had what I would describe as anarchistic politics, meaning they had an essentially anarchist political outlook without using the term. Now, in short, what I mean by anarchists in this context is people who had um, an anti-capitalist, directly democratic, horizontal, direct action-oriented political outlook. So they are basically socialists who believed in direct democracy and thought that the best means of struggle was to be in the streets, engaging in direct action, not petitioning uh, a politician. So I found that 33% of organizers had those kinds of politics without using the A word. Therefore, overall, 72% of Occupy Wall Street organizers had anarchist politics, whether explicitly or implicitly. And to me, being able to document that fact flies in the face of the dominant liberal uh, mainstream narrative that all that was going on there were a bunch of concerned citizens congregating in a park. Um, actually, the other week, uh, I was invited on a panel on CNN where I discussed slash debated with Robert Reich, um, the Clinton administration labor secretary who just came out with a movie called Inequality for All, which looks like an interesting movie. Um, about the legacy of Occupy Wall Street. I gave a, a, a rendition of my research, just as I did now, and his response was, no, but you see, the, the anarchists ruined Occupy Wall Street. And then he, he, he went on to describe that because consensus process is a failure that, that anarchists ruined Occupy Wall Street. And he's not alone in trying to present that, that fact. If you look at the liberal coverage of Occupy Wall Street, the sympathetic coverage, there's a tendency to isolate those aspects of the movement that, that um, mainstream liberals really like, such as bringing a sense of inequality back to mainstream political discourse, getting people out on the streets, um, having a sense of the 99%. Those are things that were relatively uncontroversial on the American left, but all of the prefigurative aspects of the movement were denigrated. So having general assemblies, organizing a direct democracy, trying to create networks of mutual aid, um, trying to envision a new world and do it in a different way was seen and has been seen and continues to be seen by many liberal commentators as besides the point and actually uh, contradictory to a successful movement. Even Paul Krugman, who wrote, who wrote one of the first complimentary New York Times editorials, said, oh yes, it, it is the case that most of the people in Occupy Wall Street may not have a clear sense of what they want in the world, but they're making such a fuss that it's up to the policy intellectuals and politicians to do something in response. So we'll just leave it to them. You all just make enough noise so they'll do something. And so for me, part of the um, political historical stakes in this kind of research is pushing back against that interpretation. Uh, let me give a couple more uh, stats that I found. Overall, 78% identified as an anti-capitalist of one form or another and 82% advocated some form of direct participatory democracy rather than a hierarchical uh, Republican form of democracy. 34% um, of those I interviewed did not use a political label to describe their politics, one in every three, which is, I think, not only indicative of Occupy, but also indicative of the American left, which um, likes to see itself as post-ideological, post-political, um, given the sort of... Um, the terror that the Cold War unleashed on, on left politics in this country. Um, 
Only three people self-identified as a progressive, only two self-identified as a liberal. Now that's not to say that there weren't more people in the movement with politics that might fall under that rubric, but it came to be, those words came to be seen as um, too moderate, too mainstream. One interesting example was uh, a friend of mine named Karanja, who um, is a Kenyan immigrant who uh, moved to the United States and got a job working for Deutsche Bank on Wall Street and was laid off and saw the protests and got, got involved and got really active. He told me in the interview that he started out identifying as a liberal. He used the word liberal to talk about what he thought. But then he, he, he learned that, quote, the word liberal is a dirty word. So now he identifies as a socialist. So I think it's interesting if we're thinking about radical, radicalization and how people come to more radical politics that it's not always so much based on ideas, but it's based on social context in many cases and how language is used. Because in the, in the context of Occupy Wall Street, there were a number of people who were first and foremost concerned with how their political self-presentation resonated with their peers and would adjust their language and self-presentation in order to adjust to a social context and then the politics would often follow. 7% um, <coughs> use the word socialist to describe themselves. 9% use terms like left or radical. And one of my favorite statistics, 30% of all organizers had no previous political experience at all. So that's approximately 60 people who had never done more than perhaps cast a ballot walked into Zuccotti Park and in a matter of months had their whole worldview transformed to the point where they became dedicated around the clock organizers. Um, and just uh, turning a little bit to the, the title of the book is Translating Anarchy and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But I think this statistic helps point in that direction. Um, of the self-identified anarchists I spoke to, 65% said that if they were speaking to an average person on the street, a reporter, or a friend of theirs who did not understand what the word anarchist means, they would use a different language to express their ideas and their perspectives. 65%. And to me, that along with some other information which I'll share shortly, indicate that when you look at the self-identified anarchists of Occupy Wall Street and those with anarchistic politics who didn't use the word, there was a strong tendency to try and look at directly democratic, horizontal, radical politics and express them in a way that people could understand. The goal was to be understood. And so that's what I mean by translating anarchy. It's the idea that in the context of Occupy Wall Street, much of what was going on among the organizers of the movement was a self-conscious attempt to, to transmit, to communicate um, these kinds of anti-authoritarian politics to a mass audience. So I'm gonna read a little excerpt from the book that gives you a little texture of where some of us were coming from. For the majority, uh, the majority of OWS anarchists emphasize the ideas behind anarchism rather than their misunderstood label. Axel, 23, an anarchist organizer from Manhattan with the Outreach and Direct Action Working Groups, said that the word anarchist is commonly, quote, used for teenagers in all black clothing and crass patches. Likewise, Boots, 21, an anarchist active with Direct Action who got politicized through SDS in college, said that journalists, quote, think that the anarchist is the middle-class white liberal college student who dresses in all black and runs around the streets at night and breaks property with no political analysis and no understanding and just likes to create chaos. I'm sure many of us are familiar with these stereotypes. Indeed, quote, the point is to be approachable and relatable, explained S. For Joe Robin, an anarchist involved in Occupy New Orleans before coming to New York to work with the Puppetry Guild and facilitation, it's, quote, more important to walk away from a conversation with someone feeling comfortable with my ideals, whether or not they use the same language that I use. Instead of explicitly addressing anarchism, organizers like Sergio Jimenez, 26, an anarchist from Texas who quit his job and came all the way to New York to work with the kitchen and sanitation groups, would speak about the values of autonomy, horizontalism, egalitarianism, and mutual aid. Uh, Patrick Bruner, 23 was more or less the press working group by himself in the early days of the movement, and he came up with a list of political terms that were polarizing that he would avoid using with the press that included capitalism, anarchism, communism, and free market. He added that when we talk about this movement, 
we talk about a post-political, directly democratic, people-powered, egalitarian movement, and when you put all those words together, it means anarchism. Now, some people may think that this is kind of strange for anarchists to phrase their language in understandable, relatable terms, but actually there are a number of interesting historical precedents. Uh, one of the most notable is Ricardo Flores Magón, the Mexican anarchist who organized the Partido Liberal Mexicana, and there's a pamphlet in the back if you want to learn more. Um, and the Liberal Party was an anarchist group, but it was used the language of liberalism to get people involved. Uh, other examples include Gustav Landauer in uh, Germany, who organized the Socialist Bund, which was an anarchist group, but he thought the word socialism played better. Um, and there are a number of other examples I get into in the book. And so, but the, but the point here is not that, obviously, as I'm being hosted by Rochester Red and Black, the point is not that people shouldn't explicitly talk about anarchism. After all, my book is explicitly about anarchism. But the point is that what we were successful in doing in Occupy Wall Street was bringing people in with certain kinds of accessible language and then um, gradually radicalizing them. Now, what I mean by that is that I think that Occupy Wall Street in New York had essentially three layers of communication with the broader uh, public. The first layer was the newspaper, the Occupy Wall Street Journal, uh, the website, OccupyWallST.org, and the press working group, which articulated a broad radical message to the wider society. And those layers of media, of which I was an active part, essentially tried to get a few basic things across to people to encourage them to join. Um, there were three main messages, I would say. The, the first message was, the economy is broken and it only works for the 1%. The second one would be, we can't turn to the politicians because they're in the back pockets of Wall Street. And the third one is, the only solution can come through people power. Now, obviously, there are a wide variety of interpretations of any of those three things. And that kind of multivalent um, tone is what we were trying to go with. The idea was to try and create language that had a radical message, but that wouldn't scare people away. Because if we had organized a movement around an explicitly anarchist, or even explicitly anti-capitalist banner, it wouldn't have become the dynamic force that it was. The second layer of communication were sort of more long-form writings, like the title, the Occupy Theory Journal, if you read title, you'll see that it's more explicitly radical and has more analysis, because anyone who would read that would probably already be familiar with Occupy Wall Street, and so can get more in depth with them. And then the third layer, I think, were groups such as In Our Hearts, which was an anarchist um, distribution group that had free anarchist literature on the, on the table, sort of like we have in the back here, and the experience of actually participating. In the course of my interviews, I interviewed 13 people who said that they came into Occupy Wall Street identifying with mainstream political ideas and walked out as an anarchist. 13 people. And actually, there are two more that didn't identify as an anarchist but subsequently do after my interviews based on Facebook. I, I can see that they changed their mind. They should have told me that when I was doing the interview. But anyway, <laughs> uh, 13 people. And I asked them, you know, how is it that you came to these ideas? And there were really two things that people cited. Um, the first was engaging in direct actions, engaging in directly democratic struggle, participating in networks of mutual aid, and as one, um, actually Austin, as he said, as Austin said, um, participating in a culture of care in a group of people where people actually uh, care about you as a person, try to support you, and it's not so atomized and individualized. And related to that, the second part is actually meeting anarchists and seeing that we're not scary people, we're friendly, we care about things, and we try to be as nice as possible. Those two things put together, acting like an anarchist and meeting anarchists, was in this context how anarchists were created. And I think that for those of us trying to promote that project, I think that's worth um, keeping in mind. Um, I also haven't gone into great depth as to what anarchism is, but I'm sure you can ask any of the Rochester Red and Black people or us about more details on that. Uh, a few more stats, and then I'm going to wrap up with a few more points, and then I'll hand the, the floor over to Nathan. 71% um, of those interviewed were white, 11% were of African descent, 8% were Latinos, 6% were South Asian or East Asian, and 4% were other. So obviously, Occupy Wall Street was rightly criticized for being excessively white, 
and I would say that the organizers were even whiter than the people that uh, supported the movement. And in many ways, and I address it um, in the book to some extent, in many ways the movement wasn't very well prepared to deal with race and there was an, um, an excessive tendency among a lot of white organizers to assume that Occupy was post-racial and that the way to deal with race issues was to say that uh, we're no longer white or black or what have you, we're all occupiers. Sort of a modern update on the we're all workers notion of the 19th century. Um, one of the things that Occupy Wall Street was criticized for most strongly was not having a short, discrete list of one or two demands that we would feed to the press. But actually only four of the organizers I interviewed said that they wanted to have such a list. Most agreed for various reasons that it was better to leave it broad and inclusive, which I agree with. Um, but 18 agreed that we should have come up with a list as we went along. Uh, the average age was 31, uh, although a large percentage of organizers were under the age of 30. Um, and the organizers were overwhelmingly college educated. I think that people came from a wide variety of class backgrounds, and it wasn't always easy for me to tell what class origins people had, but many were college educated and many from very elite institutions. Um, in terms of electoral politics, in 2008, 66% of OWS organizers who were eligible to vote voted for Obama, 13% for NATO or the Green Party. In 2012, I did my interviews before the election, so this is what people intended to do, but in 2012, only 16% said they definitively intended to vote for Obama, 20% were unsure what they would do. Now, I think most of the people who were unsure in, ended up voting for Obama, so I think that probably the more accurate statistic would be about 26, 27%, but even so, the drop-off from 2008, where it was 66%, to 2012, where it was 26%, 66 to 26 is a huge drop. And I think it reflects the fact that in 2008, we all know there was a lot of enthusiasm for the Obama uh, presidency, um, obviously for the historic value that having an African American has in the office, but also because he seemed like he would be the most left president that the country's had in a long time. And obviously for various reasons, he's disappointed a lot of people. And so I think that Occupy Wall Street probably wouldn't have been as successful as it was if it had been organized in 2009, for example, before a lot of the young people who went door to door for Obama got really disappointed and disenfranchised and felt like they didn't really have a place politically and then gravitated to Occupy Wall Street. Um, in the book I also have discussions about some of the hot topic issues, whether or not they should have been or not. It's another discussion pertaining to nonviolence and violence, revolution, black bloc, etc. If people have questions in the q and I can get into that, but I'm not going to do that now. And I'm just going to wrap up with one more point um, there were strong debates about whether or not it's useful to use consensus or majority voting, and um, I'm not going to get into the, the, the intricacies of that now, but if people want to talk about that, we can. But one of the main problems that I noticed from the interviews is, I would ask people, what do you think about direct democracy? And a lot of people would say, I think it's great, it's really empowering, I feel like my voice matters in a directly democratic setting, but I don't see how it can be done beyond a group of 15 or 20 people. And to me, that made me very sad, and it, it showed that we had failed, because if you look at the history of direct democracy or of anarchist organizing, there have been union federations and groups with thousands, hundreds of thousands of members spread across several countries that have organized themselves in a directly democratic manner, often using a delegate system, which differs from a representative system because representatives are people that you select to make decisions for you, delegates are people you empower to represent the decisions already made by a smaller group. But nevertheless, there are ample historical precedents to show that direct democracy works and that it can work at a large scale. In Occupy Wall Street, for various reasons, we didn't project that. And I think that in terms of those, who, those of us who want to promote a more participatory direct democracy, the next time around we have a social movement, we need to create bodies that can scale up. And that was something that we failed at miserably. And, and finally, also, I think that a little anarchist commentary on, on Occupy Wall Street, I think that anarchists of New York City were not adequately prepared for Occupy Wall Street to, to make the most out of it. Because although a lot of people participated, they learned the hand signals, they went through the procedures of direct democracy, now that it's more or less over, a lot of them are scattered to the wind and are doing sometimes doing great stuff, sometimes not doing anything at all. But I just want to emphasize that that's why I think it's important to have a group like Rochester Red and Black 
which can come into a movement like this and articulate in a very clear, well thought out manner, an anarchist perspective, invite people who are involved to come to meetings, come to events, to learn more about it, and essentially have a receptacle for anarchist politics during a movement and, and afterwards. So I applaud you all for doing what you do. Um, that's all for now. I just want to re relate uh, uh, the experience of, of hearing something like that talk for the for the first time in New York uh, at Blue Star's <coughs> store uh, in a room full of people who Mark interviewed for the book uh, and who were participants. Uh, it was just amazing to hear his talk. Look at these people who, you know, I've been getting to know over the last two years. Uh, had been really grateful to get to know and to learn so much about them. Through through the talk and through the, the research that Mark did, so I think I think his work is really important, and uh, uh, I'm really grateful for it. Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to start just by explaining. Uh, yeah. So just maybe speak a little more into the mic. A little more into the mic, like this. Yeah. yeah. Great. Sorry about that. I want to start out by explaining a bit about what the. Um, what the title of my book means. It's Thank You Anarchy, Notes from the Occupy Apocalypse. And uh, the Thank You Anarchy, people sometimes ask where that came from. It, it, it came from uh, the title of an article that I did in 2001, 2000, or 2011, uh, uh, a few months into the movement, in response to one of these uh, 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 articles by a prominent liberal professor uh, in the New York Times where he uh, worries in public that, um, that the Occupy movement, of which he's not really a participant, uh, uh, is being destroyed by the anarchists. And this was one of these attempts, you know, as Mark has been doing as well, to insist that it was, if not always anarchists uh, in particular, anarchist ideas that were driving this movement, that made it catch fire and it made it capture people's imaginations. And I think that really can't be uh, uh, overemphasized. It's incredibly important, even beyond just people who identified as anarchists. And that's, that kind of appeal is what I'm going to try to explore more in this talk. The second half of the title, uh, Notes from the Occupy Apocalypse, that word apocalypse tends to catch people. Um, uh, it sounds very religious and so forth. Um, you know, my, my background is in the study of religion, so I'm kind of always instinctively grasping for those words. But apocalypse to me, I think, you know, we, we associate it kind of with the end of the world or something like that. What it really means in Greek is an unveiling, you know, a moment of revelation. And that's what I think a lot of people experienced because of this movement. And that's what I tried to document. That's the experience I tried to document. Now, that was a revelation about society about the depth of injustice, of wrongness in the society that we live in. You know, and that includes, you know, we've heard a lot about economic inequality, but, but I think for a lot of people it was about the violence of the police, it was about racial injustice, it was about coming to some kind of consciousness about what race really looks like in, uh, in 21st century uh, United States and a whole range of other issues. It was, it was a kind of, uh, it, it was, it was a, an experience that so many people as individuals too, in the midst of this social revelation, uh, experienced as utterly transformative. Where even now I've been calling people uh, uh, who are spread out across the country, just checking in, uh, people who participated in Occupy, Occupy Wall Street and other places, and probably a lot of people in this room who were transformed in such a way that they can't go back to where they were before. You know, one way or another, they're doing something that they wouldn't have been doing if this movement hadn't happened. And they, in many cases, they're not calling it Occupy anymore. They're sick of that term. They're sick of that community. They're sick of, you know, <laughs> what one organizer recently described to me as the vectors of hatred that have uh, <laughs> come, to, uh, come to take over some of these organizing spaces. But they still are carrying that, that apocalypse in them and trying to figure out uh, how to live it 
uh, how to uh, try to figure out what to do next. I first, um, I first came into, uh, uh, got exposed to, to Occupy Wall Street during the planning meetings in the, the uh, summer of 2011, before the occupation began. At the time, uh, through my work with the website Waging Nonviolence, uh, we cover resistance movements around the world. Uh, I was actually covering several attempts that were simultaneously <coughs> underway to bring something like the Arab Spring to the United States, right? Or to bring it back after, after Madison. So I, was, I actually found out about Occupy Wall Street while I was at a meeting for the group of, of older folks who were planning to occupy Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. in October, and who actually did. Um, and then there were like three or four other groups. There was an anonymous subgroup that was actually also planning to occupy Zuccotti Park uh, in June. Uh, you know, it's just, and they, uh, all these crazy details. I mean, there was, it, there was something in the air at that moment, you know. Uh, af in the wake of what had happened in Egypt and Tunisia and, and uh, Spain and Greece, um, people wanted to bring something like that here. They saw themselves not just as Americans pissed off about what's happening in the United States, but as global citizens who wanted to bring this global movement home. Now I saw, um, I, I recently got to see myself depicted for about a minute in the newsroom on HBO, you know, this kind of like, um, whatever it is, like a kind of MSNBC uh, 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 fictionalized drama of a, of a ridiculous uh, uh, newsroom. Uh, but for a moment, they seemed to depict the moment when I first arrived at one of these meetings, and I had to defend my right to stay there as a journalist. Uh, at first, some people didn't want any cops or reporters around, <coughs> and this wonderful debate ensued about whether I could stay, and ultimately I was allowed to. And in the course of, that, of, of those meetings, I got to see something uh, that wasn't depicted in the newsroom, which was, you know, really interesting, sometimes really frustrating, but, you know, ultimately, really brilliant process by which this group of people took the idea that adbusters had thrown out, and basically nothing else, of Occupy Wall Street hashtag and <coughs> what is our one demand, and developed something very different. They realized that they were a group of 60 to 100 people sitting in a circle in Tompkins Square Park. They were in no position to make demands of power. They couldn't even agree on what that demand might be or whether it made, made any sense to make one. Instead, what they decided, those people meeting face to face, was that they needed to build a movement first. They needed to excite people, energize people. And they actually cared a lot less about having a big action with 20,000 people on Wall Street, then about empowering people everywhere to create their own occupations, to occupy their own streets, to recognize the ways in which Wall Street is everywhere, and to start building power everywhere. I think that was a really important recognition. Seeing that process, you know, enabled me, you know, to understand that this this, this lack of demand that, that the media made so much of at the time was not a kind of like failure of imagination. It was actually a reasonable recognition. Um, and, and uh, you know, by the time the occupation began, I had come to really admire the people who were participating, a lot of them anyway. Also, a question that I still get a lot when I talk to media or whatever about this movement is they still ask, what about the Tea Party? You know, they still want to draw that comparison, you know, and, um, you know, why has Occupy not elected these officials and so forth? And I've actually found it useful to draw an, an analogy to another right-wing construct, which is the role of churches. And, you know, this is because I spent a lot of time reporting on religion and and uh, uh, you know, the political power of religious movements in this country. And you know, if you look at the, the, the role that churches play in the right-wing apparatus, it's actually kind of, it's very much along the lines of what a lot of anarchists in Occupy uh, were looking for. You know, communities, local communities that, um, that are often very autonomous, in which people help meet one another's needs, daycare, school, 
you know, these basic essential needs that people have, loans when they need, you know, no interest loans. In a lot of ways, these churches act more anarchist than a lot of anarchists you see. Of course, there are a lot of other reasons that, they're, that they don't. But to me, that's a very strong example of a way in which the kind of theory of power and the, and the, you know, in addition to the historical precedents that Mark mentioned, that this is actually a very kind of reasonable approach to building political power in this country. Uh, uh, but it's one that we're often very blind to because we don't understand how it works. I'm going to um, read a little bit from, actually not from the book that's in the back, um, but from, <coughs> from a bit of, uh, of an introduction I just did uh, uh, for a new collection of Noam Chomsky's writing on anarchism. And uh, the reason is, is I think in some ways it echoes uh, the issues that Mark has brought up and that I think <coughs> seem like they might be relevant to this group. And this is, this is an attempt to kind of trace, um, trace the sensation, the, the way in which this movement activated people and made people interested in, in anarchism, even if they didn't exactly know what it was, you know, and they hadn't necessarily experienced, you know, an articulate version of it, but became attracted to what they saw presented in Occupy Wall Street. So the title of this introduction is Anarcho-Curious, question mark. <laughs> the first evening of a solidarity bus tour in the West Bank in Palestine, I listened as a contingent of college students from around the United States made an excellent discovery. They were all, at least kind of, anarchists. As they sat on stuffed chairs in the lobby of a lonely hotel near the refugee camp and war ravaged Janine, they probed one another's political tendencies, which were reflected in their ways of dressing and their most recent tattoos. <laughs> All of this, along with stories of past trauma, made their way out into the light over the course of our 10-day trip. I think I would call myself an anarchist, one admitted. Then another jumped into the space this created. Yeah, totally. Basic agreement about various ideologies and idioms ensued. Ableism, gender queerness, Zapatista's black bloc's borders. The students took their near unison as an almost incalculable coincidence though it was no such thing. This was the fall of 2012, just after the one-year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. A new generation of radicals had experienced a moment in the limelight and a sense of possibility, and had little clear idea about what to do next. They had participated in an uprising that aspired to organize horizontally, that refused to address its demands to the proper authority, and that, like other concurrent movements around the world, prided itself on the absence of particular leaders. One couldn't, one couldn't call the Occupy movement an anarchist phenomenon per se, though some of its originators were self-conscious and articulate anarchists. Most who took part wouldn't describe their objectives that way. Still, the mode of being that Occupy swept so many people into with its temporary autonomous zones and public squares nevertheless left them feeling, as it was sometimes said, anarcho-curious. The generation most activated by Occupy is one for which the Cold War means everything and nothing. We came to consciousness in a world where communism was a doomed proposition from the get-go, vanquished by our Reagan-esque grandfathers and manifestly genocidal to boot. Capitalism won fair and square. Market forces work. A vaguer kind of socialism, such as what furnished the functional train systems that carried us on backpacking trips across Europe, still held some appeal. Yet the world's socialism has been so thoroughly tarnished in the hegemonic soundbites of Fox News as to be obviously unusable politically. It's also the word Fox associates with Barack Obama, whom this generation's door knocking helped elect but whose administration strengthened the corporate ol oligarchy, waged unaccountable robot wars, and imprisoned migrant workers and heroic whistleblowers at record rates. So much for socialism. Anarchism, then, for many people, is a corner backed into rather than a conscious choice, an apophatic last resort, and a fruitful one. It permits being political outside of the red and blue confines of what is normally referred to as politics in the United States without being doomed to a major party's inevitable betrayal. We can affirm the values we've learned on the internet, transparency, crowdsourcing, freedom to, freedom from. We can be ourselves. 
Anarchy is the political blank slate of the early 21st century. It is a shorthand for the eternal now, for a chance to restart the clock. Nowhere is this more evident than in the anarchic online collective Anonymous, whose only qualification for membership is having effaced one I one's identity, history, origins, and responsibility. This anarchist amnesia that has overtaken radical politics in the United States is a reflection of the amnesia in US politics generally. With the exception of a few shared mythologies about our founding slaveholders and our most murderous wars, we like to imagine that everything we do is being done for the very first time. Such amnesia can be useful because it lends a sensation of pioneering vitality to our undertakings that the rest of the history-heavy world seems to envy. But it also condemns us to forever reinvent the wheel. And this means missing out on what makes anarchism worth taking seriously in the end. The prospect of learning over the course of generations how to build a well-organized and free society from the ground up. Our capacity to forget is astonishing. In 1999, a horizontal spokes council organized the protests that helped shut down the World Trade Organization in Seattle. Just over a decade later, a critical mass of Occupy Wall Street participants considered such a decision-making structure an illegitimate and intolerably reformist innovation. <coughs> Despite whatever extent to which we have ourselves to blame for our amnesia, however, it has also been imposed on us through repression against the threat anarchism was once perceived to pose. Remember that an, anarchist, uh, that an American president was killed by an anarchist, and another anarchist assassination set off World War I. There are still unmarked gashes on the buildings along Wall Street left over from anarchist bombs. More usefully, and more dangerously, anarchists used to travel across the country teaching industrial workers how to organize themselves and demand a fair share from their robber baron bosses. Thus, the official questionnaire at Ellis Island sought to single out anarchists coming from Europe. Thus, Italian anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti were martyred in 1927, just as roving grand juries imprison anarchists without charge today. Thus, we see, we see liberal sleights of hand, such as the one described in chapter 3 of this book, by which the anarchist popular revolution underway during the Spanish Civil War was deftly erased from history. Anarchism's slate is really anything but blank. And to end, you know, I think this, this, um, you know, what I'm trying, what what I hope to do is is offer a challenge. I think in terms of what has to be articulated, you know, what what needs to be articulated, <coughs> what, what isn't available to so many people, isn't part of the education system, is a part of our history, it isn't available to people, and so the result is is they get this kind of thin, one-dimensional, ahistorical anarchism. And, and just to conclude, I'd like to read um, a passage from, uh, uh, that I quote in this from Amish to Catalonia, Orwell's uh, uh, account of the Spanish Civil War. I'm sure many of you will, will recognize it, but I think it's striking because with a few proper nouns adjusted, um, almost the same thing uh, could have been used to describe Occupy Wall Street. The only difference being that uh, this passage refers to an entire region rather than one square in a city. You know, this is a point again that Mark raised toward the end of his talk. I had dropped more or less by chance into the only community of any size in Western Europe where political consciousness and disbelief in capitalism were more normal than their opposites. Up here in Aragon, one was among tens of thousands of people, mainly though not entirely of working class origin, all living at the same level and mingling on terms of equality. In theory, it was perfect equality, and even in practice, it was not far from it. There is a sense in which it could be true to say that one was experiencing a foretaste of socialism, by which I mean that, prevail that the prevailing mental atmosphere was that of socialism. Many of the normal motives of civilized life, snobbishness, money, grubbing, fear of the boss, etc., had simply ceased to exist. <coughs> The ordinary class division of society had disappeared to an extent that is almost unthinkable in the money-tainted air of England. There was no one there except the peasants and ourselves, and no one owed anything, no one owned anything else as his master. Sorry, no one owned anyone else as his master. Of course, 
such a state of affairs could not last. It was simply a temporary and local phase in an enormous game that is being played out over the whole surface of the earth. But it lasted long enough to have its effect upon anyone who experienced it. However much one cursed at the time, one realized afterward that one had been in contact with something strange and valuable. One had been in a community where hope was more normal than apathy or cynicism, where the word comrade stood for comradeship and not, as in most countries, for humbug. One had breathed the air of equality. And again, I would suggest that it's the job of a group like this to keep that air in circulation, to keep that air breathable, and to make it available to people who so desperately want it and need it. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, I'm going to do moderating a little Q&A with these guys. Um, they did great. That was awesome. Um, I just wanted to real quick before we get started, um, the sign-in sheet's still going around. If you haven't signed in yet, please do so. Uh, also, uh, I will be passing this around. Uh, feel free to put a couple of bucks in it. Uh, it really helps support uh, Rust to Red and Black and all the work we do, such as educationals like this, and bring in fine folks from out of town to come speak to us. So I'm going to pass this around, and uh, let's take the uh, first, first couple of questions. Actually, Mark, you had said something about uh, about how the organizers had changed their wording for, um, like, uh, when they spoke about their political affiliations. I kind of didn't understand exactly what you sure. meant by that. Could you explain yeah. that a little bit? Of course. Um, so, sometimes what I like to say is, I'm not an anarchist, I'm not, I don't believe in mutual aid and solidarity because I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarchist because I meet, believe in mutual aid and solidarity. So for me the word anarchist is like a little label that I put on top of all the things that I believe and to me is, I can take it or leave it, you know, it's, it's about what's being done, what people, how people interact with each other. And so likewise, the goal of, of many of the people in Occupy Wall Street was to say, if we believe in all this great stuff and people misunderstand the word that's being used to describe it, let's at least, to start out with, not use the word. So, um, when I would be speaking to the press, I would say, you know, we need uh, an economy where our needs are met. We need an economy where people have food, they have shelter, they have education, they have yada, yada, yada. And, and so, when you, when you talk about it that way, though, that's language that I, I think of as a bridge between a normal, quote-unquote, perspective that um, for example, when, when a worker does a job, they should get paid based on what they do. A bridge between that and a more radical critique of capitalism. And so the idea is that since we don't have a legitimate left in this country, it's useful to use some of the popular political perspectives that are out there, delegitimize them, or change their meaning in a radical direction. Um, so, so as I just mentioned, there's this popular belief that um, a job is fair when people get paid what they should get paid for the job. Now, we can, we can destabilize the, the supposed relationship between capitalism and getting, pay, getting paid fairly by pointing to what happened in the economic crisis. In 2008, hardworking people who had worked their whole lives, done the right thing, were losing their houses without a job, struggling to get by, where people who uh, had been proven to be criminals on Wall Street, like documented had broken the law, were still going on vacation to the Bahamas. So speaking that way destabilizes the whole notion of meritocracy and capitalism and opens this great space and this great opportunity to take things in a more radical direction. Now my point isn't that um, I or anyone else like didn't say what we believed. It's all about what language we're talking about and I think that as I try to show in the book, in many cases we succeeded in bringing people in with these more broad comments. So you'd see, see an interview on TV, oh you know I like how that guy talks, show up at the park this is really great. I'm going to get involved in an organizing group. And then gradually, that, that I think is a successful model of political action that isn't only something Occupy Wall Street did, but that's, that's how organizing works in many cases. You start out with where people are and you, you uh, bring them along with you. 
I have a question that in a way follows, uh, thank you to, to both of you, very uh, inspiring. Um, the way in which you saw it was useful to translate um, makes me wonder um, what is the attachment to the word anarchy given that it has so many connotations uh, if not denotations, that are not uh, um, palatable to many of us. And yet, the notion of a communitarian, egalitarian, just, caring, um, non-oppressive society is hugely appealing. So why not call it, why, why is there such an attachment to that term itself? That's one, and, and then I'd like to follow up with the other thing is that it seems to me that in all of these, both um, um, <coughs> in Africa and, and all of these movements, they're short-lived because there's no real healing element introduced. And it feels to me that having been involved for many years with reevaluation counseling and some of those mm -hmm. that, that places where they are really um, helping people to heal and then be able to think rationally and create a desirable society, that that's an element that also really needs to be included. Okay, maybe I'll address the first part and then if you have thoughts about the second. Um, I'm not per se especially attached to the word, um, and that's part of the point that I'm trying to make, and there, there are groups all across the world that do this sort of stuff without the world and without the word, and for me, you know, go get them, that's fine. Nevertheless, I, I do think that there's some I guess there's two other parts to it, though. On the one hand, I think that in the context of Occupy, there were a lot of situations where people, to some extent, had these great ideas about fairness and justice, and then would also go vote for Ron Paul, and would also do all sorts of other things that I would consider incompatible with the worldview that I'm trying to express. And so I do think there is some value in understanding how ideas relate to each other and fit into an ideological framework so that, you know, what we do democratically, how we organize in a meeting, is not entirely unrelated to how we organize ourselves economically, to how we relate interpersonally, and all these things relate to each other. And I think there's a use in understanding all of these issues under an umbrella of a certain frame of thought, certain basic principles that extend outward. And so that doesn't mean you need to use the word anarchism, but I do think that there's value in political education in understanding thoughts as they relate to each other under one ideological framework. Um, this uh, Irish comrade, maybe some people know him, Andrew Flood, uh, we were speaking about this once, and he said that if you were to come up with another word for anarchism, and eventually you got successful enough with that movement, eventually that word would also have a tainted message to it also. I mean, think about communism. What, what sounds better than having a commune and working together? But yet, historically, the word has been hopelessly, maybe not hopelessly, but it's been in this country especially really marred. So so on the one hand, um, if you're committed to any word, if you get successful enough, the authorities will taint it anyway. And I think there's value in it in terms of ideologically, but also there are powerful movements and histories around the world. Um, I spent the last year in Spain. That's a country where, although the anarchist is still understood in many, many popular circles as a terrorist, that it has a different history. And for me, on a personal level, I, I find importance in connecting what I do and what I think to the hundreds of thousands of people across the world today and in the past that have done it, and that historical legacy matters to me. But it matters to me only, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not so important to me that I let it get in the way of my organizing. So I really only use the word when I'm organizing, when I'm speaking with people who understand what it means. Um, and so using it in the book has that historical value and I think clarifying lens, because I think most of the people that are gonna check out this book are already somewhat sympathetic and using the word helps them put the ideas together. But it's, you know, it's a good point. Um, Sure, same as you. Just on that point really quickly, I, I think that that sense of reclaiming a tradition is really important and, and you know, digging that history up again of people who've used that term. And it, but it's also true that there are many other terms that people use um, for similar kinds of organizing. But there's another side of it too, where I think, um, especially uh, later in the movement, after the, the uh, you know, media stopped uh, fixating on every little thing that anybody did associated with the word occupy, especially in New York. Um, 
I think people started using the word in order to provoke attention, um, and, and we're kind of using the shock value of the word. And I think that can be useful too, is to say like, I'm a scary anarchist, you know, and then everybody's like, whoa, okay, what does that mean? And then maybe they'll, um, you know, it, 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 it can kind of be, be turned around uh, in that way, which, which might be useful. I mean, actually that article I mentioned, Thank You Anarchists, uh, published I think in maybe November, December of 2011, it was easily the most you know widely circulated article I did on the movement. So I you know I think that that word has a kind of viral appeal, too, and so you know you can play both sides. As as far as the um, the point about healing, I think that's really rich and really true. Um, one one anecdote I I recently heard the other day. I was talking with a, a fellow who who runs an organization that works with homeless youth. Um, uh, he just wrote, a, his name's Adam Bucko, he just wrote a, another Occu book called Occupy Spirituality. Uh, one thing that he found, though, uh, and I've seen this, you know, in, anecdotally myself some, is that people that he was working with um, who were having serious addiction issues were often shaken out of it by that, by the experience of coming into Occupy. I mean, there was a kind of healing quality of the, of that, of that, of the power of that short-lived experience. But I think also you're pointing to something really, really important, which is, which I think also connects to the amnesia that both of us have been talking about, is that I think that the historic, the, the kind of official idea of what history and what politics is that we're taught in school is one in which social movements are short-lived, um, are, are solely kind of charismatic. Um, you know, Martin Luther King comes out of the sky uh, drops down for a few years, does everything, and then departs. Or Tarver Square comes out of nowhere, does something, and then departs. You know, this is this is the lie that we're fed over and over again. Um, you know, in every case, these movements are driven by longer-term structures. By by you know, the the real, incredibly important work is done by people who are building these kinds of communities on all sorts of levels, labor organizations, uh, uh, community organizations, religious organizations, all sorts of things. And, you know, and, 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 and I think a lot of people came into Occupy with this kind of false history, this false political science, that this could happen in a couple of weeks, that something major could happen in a couple of weeks, and that's all it would take. So they didn't prepare for that longer term work. But actually a lot of the people who were really driving this movement and, and giving it a lot of its um, a lot of its strength and power were people who have been working in sustainable organizing spaces and the reason they were able to contribute so much to the movement was because of those sustainable organizing spaces and because of their communities that helped them heal and helped them work through um, you know the, the inevitable burnout of these kind of brief flashes so I, again I think that's you know another reason why groups like this are so important To sort of try and push as many people as possible to be um, in line with anarchist thought as completely as possible from an anarchist perspective, but also, even if you look at the, the quote-unquote heydays of anarchist organizing, there was never a case where any of these movements were 100% consistent with the, with the ideology, because people just don't operate that way. But it's useful, and Occupy was useful, in creating a, a setting where the various tenets became really popular. So. Um, the next time we have a social movement, it seems self-evident to me that young people will organize themselves in a directly democratic way. Um, identification with capitalism has been seriously tainted. Uh, so a number of these facets have become broadly disseminated. The term mutual aid has become so omnipresent in left circles that some people don't even know that it has an anarchist um, orientation, at least in, in its origins and its ideological meaning. So, yeah, it's making real anarchists, uh, real anarchists, right? And it's also um, spreading the ideas even to people who don't realize where they come from. You don't mind me asking a follow-up? 
uh, how big of a boost do you think it was? Like 100%, 20%, order of magnitude? You know, it's, it's, it, I find it hard sometimes to figure out how optimistic or pessimistic to be with any of this because I met a Marxist professor who said, well, you see, Occupy didn't topple capitalism, so really, like, what, you know, why bother? And that's obviously the extreme <laughs> pessimism. But then there are other people who, we, who we've met who, who, who would say things like, we're here, we're together in a park, we've won, and, and you know, imagining doves flying overhead. So it's hard to steer the exact balance in between, um, but... I, don't, I think that considering where we started from, it did a hell of a lot, but if you go to other countries where anarchism is a legit force, you'll see how far we have to go. Yeah, I, I think, I think that that's a good moment also to just flag some, some real challenges. I think that, um, in turn, that, that, that a lot of people out there are, are um, excuse me, Challenges that people who are articulating anarchism have in talking about it with people who are out there, and I think there are forces that that make people that have drawn people into, you know, anarcho curiosity, you know, as a uh, word I use um, that that one should be a little careful about. One I think in particular is the kind of corporate culture of um, of the dot com industry. Right. I mean, I, I just did a, a profile of some of the, of one occupier who now works for Google, you know, and has been saying that you know her work environment at Google is more horizontal than you know what she was experiencing at Occupy, and you know it may feel that way, but it's still like owned by Wall Street and, and uh, bought by the NSA, um, and and we have to learn to distinguish that. We have to we have to learn to recognize that. There are ways in, in which people are drawn to certain anarchy, anarchist -y spaces for reasons that might not be fully about ending up all forms of oppression and creating an egalitarian society. We have to be really careful of that. And the, a lot of those came up in Occupy. Um, and a lot of these are fueled by the structure of the internet, I think, especially in the younger generation. Um, uh, uh, and, the, the other thing, briefly, that I'll bring up that we haven't talked about is the role of other forms of libertarians in the movement. I mean, especially at the very beginning, there was a pretty substantial contingent, I don't know about here, but in New York, and definitely in other places, of people who kind of identify libertarian right, Ron Paul, um, that sort of thing. They're drawn to libertarian ideas. They're drawn to the site, to, to the, to, to a lot of, a lot of what, is held in common with the anarchist tradition, but what's been made available to them is this capitalist libertarianism, where you know we're concerned about government oppression, but we're not remotely concerned about uh, uh, the oppression of capital and and, uh, and and other forms. So, and and that's that's a that's a idea that's articulated much more in the public square today. So, I think while there's this feeling that that more people than you know, a decade ago, or two decades, ago, or five years ago, were open to anarchist ideas. There are also these pitfalls that have to be addressed, and and that we have to be aware of. Okay. Uh, next couple of questions. Uh, it's Susan Chuck Collin. Uh, do you want to just uh, get a batch of questions yeah, yeah, and then great. do it, and then we'll wrap up soon? Um, I was down um, during the. There was a big labor march. And one of the things that I was, you know, that struck me, first of all, it was over an hour that I was filming people just walking. I mean, that was pretty awesome. But I was thinking about the fact of, like, these institutions, like the unions and all, and, and different groups that were there, and how, how was it to not let Occupy kind of get, um, taken over by um, some of these powerful groups. Um, my question is, uh, it's a fairly speculative question, but um, due to your guys' um, participation in this movement, do you think that this movement will pave the way for a you know, broader and more decisive revolutionary struggle? I was just curious about um, 
sort of differing tendencies internal to anarchism, right? Not as like a monolithic anarchism, but like the variety of different thought there. And if you saw what tendencies you saw sort of most represented, and, and maybe if you saw any specific collectives or organizations uh, routinely engaging in good or bad ways. I'll take that third one now. Um, so just to respond to the third question first. Yes, there, there are a lot of tendencies within anarchism, and I, I speak about it generally because I assume that the people who are very familiar with those tendencies is you know, not the main audience usually, but um, I think that the vast majority of the people that I interviewed could be clar classified as small a anarchists of the sort of David Graeber variety. Um, now, to, to clarify that a little bit without getting too lost in the woods on it, um, some theorists have sort of um, talked about a difference between anarchists who are focused more on, oh, I don't even know how to get into all this, but, but people basically, um, Rochester Red and Black uh, is a very, um, <laughs> is a very awesome. Um, what, most of the anarchists were not actually like the people in Rochester Red and Black, and, and I'll, I'll talk about a few of the differences. Many of the people in, in Occupy didn't have as, um, well-articulated, uh, well-thought-out understanding of the history and theory of the, of the practice, and had politics that were uh, in sometimes, um, if not dismissive, at least not emphasizing the importance of class and, and social struggle. I think that there's a tendency in the left in the United States, or at least the radical left, to see previous movements and histories of workers' struggles as being maybe in some cases passe, maybe in some cases um, uh, struggles that didn't recognize the importance of other forms of oppression and other forms of identity and have swung so far back the other way that class is sidelined. And so I think some, some anarchists within the Occupy Wall Street might be guilty of that to some extent. There was a greater emphasis on environmental issues. Consensus process was seen as, if not synonymous with anarchism in many cases, as like the obviously best way to make decisions, but historically, um, many groups in the anarchist tradition have done majority voting, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rochester Red and Black does majority voting, for example. Um, so without getting too far into it, I would say many were sort of the small a variety, consensus, info shop, um, countercultural variety. And there was actually very little presence of any organized anarchist groups, which is part of, in my conclusion in my book, what one of the sort of um, bad things that came out of this is that there weren't enough anarchist groups already formed, already strong enough to take on the weight of new people ready to surge into the breach because other than In Our Hearts which was the, uh, they distributed the free pamphlets and a number of people that was their first ever experience with anarchist <coughs> ideas were those photocopy pamphlets which shows you how much photocopy pamphlets can do they can do a lot um, but there weren't really other organized groups for better or for worse um, there wasn't even much presence of crime thing. There, there were no sort of quote unquote class struggle anarchist groups there. And, and almost no one that I interviewed who identified with anarchist politics ever mentioned any organized anarchist groups or I think probably even knew about them. People spoke about having participated in collective houses, getting, in, getting into things through punk rock and so forth. So um, that's, I think, there's value in, in what you all are doing. I'll address some of the other things. Yeah. Um, as far as where this is going, I, I think, I mean, if there's one thing I learned in uh, uh, my trying to tell stories about Occupy, it's that my predictions never went anywhere, never did me any good, uh, or anybody else. Um, I, I do think that just a kind of general tendency is that is that a lot of people have spread out and are doing like work of various kinds, uh, much more community-based work than Occupy was. Occupy was in many ways a kind of performance, um, and and now many of the people activated through that performance are doing intensive engagement with people who are most affected by capitalism. Um, I think it's a real open question of how that work will come together again into a political force. Um, uh, but I think that's the challenge: is to deepen the work and then to and then to uh, regroup. Um, as far as the question of co-optation, um, I, I think it's really it's really <coughs> interesting. It's one that I puzzled over a lot over the course of the movement. There was a lot of anxiety about it, um, especially 
in the moments where the movement felt less strong um, in the in early 2012 in particular um, with efforts like the uh, Occupy Spring or was that what it's called? 99 percent spring yeah that a lot of unions were organizing you know there's a real deep concern and certainly in the May Day process in New York hugely um, uh, there was concern and justification for concern about about what role these organizations might have in co-opting. Um, what I, my reaction to a lot of that was that there was much more anxiety about that and much less th than there was discussion about how the movement might actually co-opt those organizations, co-opt those organizations, and the extent to which the movement had co-opted those organizations and created situations that forced them to do uncomfortable things and that, and that made opportunities for certain people in those organizations to go on a limb and try to pull their, their organizations in more radical directions. And, you know, I think a more healthy approach, um, you know, in the future might be to have a lot more strategizing about how a movement like this, especially one that's so, that, that has at its center such a radical analysis, can pull those organizations and be patient about the process that's going to be required to do that. Um, and to recognize the power that this kind of movement can have, you know, to pull, to, you know, recognizing that these organizations are never going to drive the movement, they're never going to command it, they're never going to be the, you know, the, the kind of vanguard, they just can't. But, um, you know, but there are strategies that movements can employ um, to make use of the power that those organizations have. Uh, are there a couple other questions? I'd like to ask the speakers to uh, react to the news that uh, California has raised its minimum wage to $10 an hour and uh, the possibility of permanently transforming minimum wage to a living wage, say uh, $12.50 from Bono County, New York, and uh, uh, adjusting the work week length, say, to 36 hours until we have full employment and uh, adopting a single payer of health care, uh, perhaps uh, rather identical to the one in Canada. Uh, if there are a couple other questions, we'll take those in, in another round, same kind of thing so far. I heard, um, I heard rumors of this like power struggle between uh, <coughs> rejectionist anarchists uh, who are afraid of co-optation and sort of like reformy uh, people who wanted to work with existing organizations uh, that played out around May Day and S17, and that might be inside gossip, but I would love to know like what you guys got out of that, or if it matters at all. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, was there a third? Okay, yeah. Um, this is sort of piggybacking on, on, on what I was asking before, but um, <coughs> given that there is a possibly an upward trend in this universe we're in and other forces that want exactly the same kind of world that you want. Um, and I spoke to Mark about the, for instance, the Pachamama Alliance, um, which has a, also a spiritual dimension. And I see it through the process of the evaluation counseling. What, what is there, would there be a value in a sort of expanding, not holding tight to this is our movement, this is the movement we need, but seeing how do we feed this, all these larger elements that, and support whatever it might be that's going to lead us to where it is we want to go. Okay, do you want to tackle some of those? Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, um, just really quickly, I, I think the issues you're raising are really are really helpful in the, in the way that they expand our view here, you know, and, and you know, I, met, I mentioned, first of all, the way in which so many of the people who really hit the ground with Occupy Wall Street did so because they saw themselves as part of something global, and they didn't necessarily know where it was going to go, right, but they, but they wanted to <coughs> kind of pitch in to this global experience. You know, and and I think I think it is very important on a on a certain level to see uh, this movement in spiritual terms, and to see any movement in spiritual terms, and in, in that it's a sense, it's a calling to 
um, a sense of possibility. Uh, it, it's, you know, people who were participating, um, you know, I think among the mature ones would, would recognize in, in interviews and so forth that, that they can't know what the world might look like, where this movement is going, because they feel themselves as being so constrained by capitalism and so forth that, that they can only kind of push into a dark room, you know, and feel their way uh, with a sense of faith. Uh, lead. Um, you know, I, I think that that it's important to, as much as we want to like identify our politics and and ideas, it's important to keep that kind of unknowing in view. Um, as far as May Day, um, there was were definitely internal battles uh, about what kind of tax to take with regard to unions. I, I have a, a chapter in my book um, uh, called Crazy Eyes. That's an account of the May Day process, uh, which was a really fascinating experience, and in some ways, for me, crystallized a lot of um, what was what had been going on, the issues that had been going on in the movement all along, um, I, and I think it was a really under-discussed, um, you know, really important process. Um, and, uh, and as far as minimum wage and living wage, and um, my my one contribution to offer there is that is that I'm now trying to um, uh, bring back the idea of a four-hour workday. And, and <laughs> I'm sick of all this work. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, there's there's a really interesting discussion about that uh, taking place, like in, at, for instance, uh, Jacobin magazine uh, right now. But in general, I I just think it's astonishing <coughs> that um, the masses aren't demanding less work. <laughs> like, what happens all of the science fiction that um, all, was basically ever written in which the future would allow us to work less. Like, why did we forget about that? It's, it seems vital, and, and I think it, there's a sense of imagination that's been lost there uh, that we need, that, you know, is one role of groups like this to bring back. Let me chime in on a few of these things. Um, yeah, you should check out the chapter in Nathan's book about the Mayday stuff. He does a good job in capturing a lot of those dynamics. Um, I was rather involved with it also. I was sort of the main press liaison with the Mayday planning group in terms of articulating the Mayday message to the wider public. And so, just to give people a little background, it was an interesting debate over... Everyone that was involved wanted a general strike, but there was a debate over whether or not to use the language of a general strike or to have more broader messaging. And I think that there, there's, there's interesting points to be made on both sides, but it ended up being a debate between people who thought that their constituencies, their, the local communities they organize, the unions they work with, et cetera, et cetera, wouldn't respond well to that phrase, especially in a context when we knew we couldn't actually organize one. Right, so at best it would only be symbolic, which is not to necessarily denigrate it, but it would be symbolic, versus some people who I would say were so um, fanatically committed to using the word because the word they, they seem to think would have some magical properties. And that sounds demeaning, and I intend it that way. Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I'm very much in favor of the general strike. I'm a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, which, is, which it has been committed to making a six or four hour workday for a while. Um, but I think that what got lost in some of that is, you know, if you're gonna call for a general strike, you need to be ready on May 2nd to help people who've been fired. You need to yes. use it as a way to organize, you know, it, um, and so I think there was a lot of value in having the posters and having the messaging around general strike because it put the idea into the popular thought process. It gave a sense of radicalism to things. And some people who said, well, if 100% of the workforce won't strike, we shouldn't talk about it. That's, of course, the opposite silly extreme. I was pushing, and, and ultimately we ended up doing, a, a situation where those people who wanted to propagandize for a general strike go right ahead. Those people who wanted to use different messaging go right ahead, and that's what we ended up doing. And it ended up being like the most successful May 1st we've had in New York in who knows how long. Thousands, tens of thousands of people showed up. But I mean, to me, what I try to emphasize in the book is that sometimes there's a tendency to assume that like maximalist rhetoric equals radicalism, and um, it often doesn't. You know, a lot of the people who maybe identified as anarchists and said like, if we don't call this a general strike, then to hell with you weren't actually doing much of anything and wouldn't be people that I would, you know, necessarily um, want to organize with. Um, and then referring to the way to expand the movement, I think that Nathan's right that a lot of people envisioned Occupy as a global thing, but there was also um, a parochial tendency to see Occupy as 
the epitome of all that was wonderful in the world, and to not realize that a lot of the stuff we were trying to do had been done for a long time, and was at times doing in much better ways by groups that often were predominantly people of color, but weren't getting the media attention, and to try to bring people into us instead of us looking to go to them, and that was a huge problem. So, um, yeah, looking outward is, is a big part of that, and what I'm trying to get across with the book is that there are exciting ways to do that if we really focus on messaging and how we can relate to people on their terms and not just try to stick to the same old thing all the time and, and not adjust. Cool. Uh, so we're going to take one last uh, one last round of questions and then I think we'll probably wrap up. Uh, I saw your hand and then... Um, I guess one of the things I think about with uh, anarchism, I, I think to myself, yeah, this is really great. I want to get into this. And then I go, okay, well, what's sort of the next, what's the next step? And I start looking at the future and going, well, where, do, where does it go? And I go, all right, uh, somewhere in the minimum would be like a slight curtailing of government and corporate control, and that, you know, leaves like workers in, in much better standing, all the way to like the abolition of any organized structures in, and, and, you know, United States, I'm just using this as an example. So, in between there is like a kind of uh, unpleasant revolution that happens, to put it politely. And I think about all the people who make money at exploiting workers and how they're not going to get on board with this and they're going to fight against it. And then I think, well, this is kind of really scary. Um, is that the right way to think about it, or is that a good way to think about it, and do you have an alternative view that would make me feel better? <laughs> okay, yeah, well, first of all, there's a lot of literature in the back table that addresses it better than I do, but let me offer a few thoughts. I think that there's a tendency when it comes to anarchism or revolutionary politics in general to assume a couple of things. One, that there's a dichotomy between fixing things now and making things better in the future, and second, that it has to be a process that's sort of overnight or is like one specific event. And sometimes revolutionaries have been guilty of trying to sort of simplify it that way in order to appeal to people who simply can't bear the thought of living till tomorrow. And I understand that. But I think that if you look at some of the more well thought out um, en envisionings <coughs> of anarchist revolutionary theory, there's an understanding that the notion of direct action implies a way of trying to improve things now, using our power now, building our power now, in ways that make things more bearable on a day-to-day -day level, uh, increase wages, um, build collective power towards any number of projects, but also um, basically creating the understanding among many people that we actually hold the power in society and that the more, the, the more we take steps in a direction of amassing collective power, whether at workplace or in our communities, universities, or what have you, that we more and more understand that we're the ones who make society run, that we don't need parasites telling us what to do, and that we can take steps towards a revolution. Because if you read a lot of the classic anarchist thinkers, whether Malatesta or Kropotkin or what have you, they often talk about a revolution not just as an event, but also an evolutionary process. And so there are some there are some theorists, you know, social democrats most notably, who talk about evolution at the expense of revolution. But I think that there's a really nice way that they can fit together. And if you look at the successful, directly democratic revolutionary episodes in history, they haven't been overnight. They haven't been two months like Occupy Wall Street. They've involved decades of organizing, building up strong networks, so that when there is a crisis, when the state is unable to provide, people can look to the networks they have. Um, when the boss abandons the factory because it's not profitable, we can run it. We can organize our own networks of mutual aid. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's debates over violence, nonviolence, and I think that there's a lot to be said about that. I address it in the book. But I think that if you get to the point where it's so self-evident that the, that the government is so incompetent that we have so much power, whether or not we are attacked and have to defend ourselves or the government collapses or what have you, that's that's 98% of the struggle, is getting to that point where we've built so much counter power that it's self-evident to most people that we are the people, like in a real sense, not just in a rhetorical sense, and that we should have the power. And so that's, that's I think, might alleviate some of your fears. It's not about going out tomorrow and trying to do something crazy. It's about that long-term struggle with a revolutionary view with a long-term goal in mind. Um, that's how I see it, at least. You wanted to address that, and then we had another question here. 
Um, oh, um, I, I don't know if this is exactly a question. If you could say something about infiltration um, of the movement, you know, because there's such a darkness and hopelessness if that was a big factor. Um, so I don't know if you have something to share about that. Yeah, sure. Um, there was a lot of it. Um, you know, some of it documented and some of it not. And and there there were certainly you know ways in which, for instance, the the development of of political structures within the movement were clearly hindered through infiltration. Um, and and so I think that's something that that movements have to learn how to get around. I mean, one one thing that was often striking to me is, is that, um, I mean, what, in my work as an editor at Waging Nonviolence, I'm covering movements around the world all the time that are dealing with incredible amounts of repression in all sorts of circumstances, whether it's because they're in a totalitarian state or because they're in a situation where, um, you know, where basically corporate gangs or even, or criminal gangs, whatever kind of <laughs> you know the distinction gets lost, um, but uh, but the ways in which in places in which incredible violence is wielded against resistance movements, and if this tells me anything, it's that people are capable of winning even in some of the worst odds. You know, and it's just amazing what people are able to accomplish, um, often in in cases where the repression is explicit and and ever present and and and, and um, you know people are kind of going to be smarter about preparing for it and maybe it just looks that way from the outside um, and they're going to be more careful about when they bring it upon themselves and i think you know what i saw a lot in, in occupy was this experience where people were on the one hand shocked by the repression that they experienced shocked that it was even happening and then very quick to blame that repression for the for problems within the movement. And they were correct. The repression was causing the problems within the movement. But it's the challenge of movements everywhere to work around that, that repression. It's going to happen. And it's not always going to, you know, like the Brooklyn Bridge, attract thousands and thousands of people, millions of people to be sympathetic to you. Sometimes it will actually work and make people not want to be anywhere near you. And you have to build your movement strategy around that repression. Um, and I think that this is really where we can learn so much from, from, um, from both our history and uh, the history and the, and the present work of people around the world, because this is where creativity really comes in and, and where it's possible to develop strategies that can work. Let me just add a little to that. Um, I agree with all of that. Um, second, also, I think that, um, like, for example, I spoke to some people with the outreach working group who would go door to door trying to get people to come out to some of the major Occupy events, especially after the movement had been going on for a few months. And they reported being in predominantly working class communities or communities of color, people saying, you know, I love you all, you're doing great stuff, but I'm not gonna risk being attacked by the police, I'm sorry, I've had enough of that as it is and I can't come down and risk that. And that's perfectly understandable. And I think it points to the fact that there are limitations to a protest movement insofar as it's a movement designed for people to come down and articulate a message and is not grounded in organizing on a daily basis of what people are living. I think more people will risk uh, repression if they're doing something that actually benefits themselves in an immediate, tangible way. And so, um, to me, Occupy Wall Street was great, but I think part of the reason why it eventually floundered is there's only so far you can go on a protest by itself without sinking roots into organizing. And as a point of contrast, the King Sayame in Spain, the Spanish version of, well, we're the, Span we're the American version of the King Sayame, but they're, they're sort of like an Occupy movement. They voluntarily disbanded their encampments, set up neighborhood assemblies that are super grounded in organizing, have an amazing anti-foreclosure housing rights campaign, for example, and um, obviously repression means different things in different countries, so it's not, can't just sort of uh, do a black and white comparison, but I think that that's worth remembering and, and also, to Nathan's point, um, a lot of people tended to blame infiltration or, or outside agitators screwing up our processes of democracy, but to me that points more to like we need to create 
processes that can withstand that, as, as he was saying, and, and a lot of the attention gets pointed out. Some people walked away from Occupy saying, we can't have like consensus process assemblies with people we don't know because of this. That's the, like, the opposite answer you should be coming out of it with. Instead, you should adjust your processes because organizing involves bringing in new people. Uh, Sahara, the last question, and then we're going to wrap up. I thought the Spanish were called indignados. What am I not understanding? Indignados was sort of a term used by the popular press to describe them. If you'll read any of the movement literature, they never use the word, ever. Mm -hmm. um, so Americans use the word, and I used the word, used the word until I went over there, but um, it's the 15M movement, Quince yeah. MA, 15th of May, 2011. Okay. Great. Oh. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, yeah, seriously. I, uh, I just want to let you all know about some other upcoming Red and Black events if you all are interested in attending. Um, on Sunday, October 13th, we're going to be doing an educational on uh, consent, um, both related to... Um, uh, sexual activity uh, related to rape culture, which has been a big issue in the media uh, for the last few months. Um, and uh, that's going to be put on uh, by the Women's Caucus of Rochester Red and Black. Um, it's going to be an awesome event uh, here at 4 p.m. on October 13th. Um, also, if you're interested in seeing the way that uh, an anarchist group like Red and Black functions, we're going to be having our general meeting this coming Thursday. Uh, October 3rd at uh, 7 o'clock right here at the Flying Squirrel. Um, additionally, I'd just like to give one last call out uh, for our donation bucket back there. Um, those, that money goes not only to funding educational efforts like this, um, but also we use it for things like uh, printing the free literature that we provide. Uh, and occasionally when our members decide to, take, uh, to engage in civil disobedience, we use it for bail money. Um, it's play, it plays a number of different roles, and it's incredibly important to the uh, continuing functioning of our organization. So I encourage you all to give uh, whatever you can afford, um, and check out our lit. Most of it's free um, because of the donations that people provide. So thank you all again for coming. Yeah. Like, um, I, I liked it and I wanted to share my opinion.